David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Tuesday, February 16th, 2021. I believe I've got that all down correct. And uh, what a day. Okay. Uh, Bill tells me all the way from Portland, Maine, not only that the k in the Morning Radio Show is live now, an always important thing to find out, but that I am wishing you a happy Mardi Gras, which is amazing because somehow that's not on my all-purpose NAFTA calendar. You would think it would be. Uh, but okay, uh, and this is a great idea for a giveaway, too. This is a good one. I like this. Uh, if, if your cake, the Mardi Gras, the king cake, if your cake has the plastic Jesus in it, you win the free Serta Comfort Plus from yesterday's President's Day mattress sale. That's left over, I guess. Nobody wanted that one. I wonder why that uh, became a thing mattress sales on president it really is a thing although i guess there's a mattress sale on every day basically is what's happening and uh, well you know like we said every day is president's day now that we uh, live in a unitary executive kind of a world all right well let's see many things happening today one of them being that it's tuesday which means that we'll be talking to joan mccarter hopefully if all goes well i can't imagine what would distract her from calling other than forgetting that it's tuesday today which is always a distinct possibility Tuesday, the long-suffering Tuesday, not have having a good run of it in pandemic times when all days run together. So at any rate, uh, yes, uh, the usual congressional beat, a little quieter, still plenty to cover because there's lots to do, but uh, House and Senate in recess for the week, and I mentioned uh, yesterday uh, just sort of reminding everybody that it is, it, it is improper and unfair to refer to the district work period as a congressional vacation, though surely there are some people who uh, abuse the breaks, those who are interested in being reelected, and that usually covers almost all of them, will be, uh, well, working uh, as hard on different a different phase of the game, I guess you could say, than they cover when in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> but an important week of meetings, even if they're Zoom meetings, uh, and uh, taking care of connecting with constituents and constituent groups while they're back at home. And it's not time off, although I know it's fun to call it that. Um, I guess similarly, I mentioned yesterday that Texas has been walloped in its... Uh, in, in the weather situation and dealing with lots of snow and ice. And it's become more than just that, obviously. Uh, but of course, causing a lot of traffic accidents and worse, a lot of power outages and worse than power outages. It's not just, well, the power lines got knocked down. And so that's why you have power. Apparently uh, such large swaths of the Texas electrical grid were affected and taken out that uh, power companies had to make some snap decisions about where to divert the power that they were able to generate and some controversial decisions being made, leaving residential areas without power in order to power commercial areas, many of which, by the way, were not open due to the weather, which is also problematic. And as Greg was pointing out, uh, not much in the way of infrastructure in terms of providing heat during the cold winter months that we experience here in the Northeast that they just don't usually get down there. A lot of people without heat, without means of generating heat as well, even if they had electric space heaters, no electricity. Um, but it's been interesting uh, watching in the last day or so, a lot of people pointing out, well, you know, uh, first of all, you know, reminding us, oh, well, let's not uh, beat up on, on Texans who are suffering at this point, and that's certainly a good point. But others making the point that, well, this has kind of been a long time coming. Uh, for instance, I happened to see the tweet of Robert Draper from yesterday. Uh, writer uh, lists himself as writer at the New York Times Magazine and National Geographic. Uh, and, by the way, the author of a book of, uh, called To Start a War. How do you like that? 
how the Bush administration took America into Iraq, if that's relevant to any of your thoughts about politics and uh, political agendas. Anyway, he tweeted yesterday, as long as we're commissioning studies, and I guess that's something to discuss perhaps with Joan, the idea of eh, opening up a commission to study the January 6th attacks on the Capitol. But as long as we're commissioning studies, the self-proclaimed energy hub of the United States, that's Texas, in case you didn't know, has really made a mess of its power grid, and a lot of people are suffering right now because of it. Uh, I do recall that Texas was on, or has been for many years, on something of a kick about its energy policies and its uh, uh, policies and tax policies and, and public policy favoring energy production, and in particular fossil fuel energy production, and how despite all the tut-tutting from environmentalists around the world and around the United States, they were standing strong in favor of big energy, and that would uh, pretty much blah, 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 produce all sorts of miracles, make Texas an economic hub. Everyone would move to Texas uh, with their manufacturing concerns because uh, power costs were low there, and they recognized the true genius of backing big-time power production and uh, corporate power production because reasons. I don't know, whatever. E economy. Somehow it was supposed to make sense. And then it turns out that no one was able to produce enough power after all to cover a, uh, a, a, a high demand for it. I also happened to see somebody today uh, retweeting an old tweet from Ted Cruz. Uh, where is that one? It wasn't that long ago that I saw somebody tweeting that around and passing on. It was the horse whisperer who was saying uh, hey, himself, Hi, Ted, you were saying, retweeting the tweet from Ted Cruz from August of 2020. It's not that long ago. Pointing out uh, at the time, California is now unable to perform, he says, even basic functions of civilization, like having reliable electricity. Biden slash Harris slash AOC, he's accusing in uh, August of 2020, want to make California's failed energy policy the standard nationwide. Hope you don't like air conditioning. Ha ha. Hilarious, says he's answering uh, actually a tweet from Office of the Governor of California, warning people, okay, well, you know, to uh, lessen peak demand, these are the things you want to do to try and keep us on an even keel in terms of providing electricity. But hey, Times change, and what is it now, August, so uh, September, October, November, December, January, February, hey, six months, what do you know, instead of it being a peak demand because of heat problem in California, it's a peak demand because of unexpected cold in Texas, and guess what, Texas is now unable to perform even basic functions of civilization, like having reliable electricity, Cruz, Cornyn, Abbott, I guess, right, uh, plus uh, Trump, I suppose we'll throw in there as well. Oh, and also Christy Nome, because what the hell? Anyway, uh, they all want to make Texas's failed energy policy the standard nationwide. Hope you don't like heat. That was a genius tweet I just made up. That was pretty good. I should probably be a senator, and people should regard me as a fantastic champion debater and a constitutional expert and listen to me on all things, which, you know, is not bad advice as advice goes, generally speaking. Anyway, just thought that was interesting. Also of some interest, because we mentioned the topic of Iraq and uh, the Bush-Cheney administration starting a war there, and I guess the book about how they did it, I just thought this was of some interest. I've noticed in the past day two different people, I think, although who knows, maybe it was part of the same discussion, bringing up the latest conspiracy theory to emerge from Republican ranks as the impeachment has wound down and we move toward that phase wherein people say, well, there could still be criminal prosecutions of Trump and there apparently already are and will continue to be criminal prosecutions of the people who actually took his advice and stormed the Capitol and broke in. And they will be uh, uh, facing justice at, at some point. Maybe the same thing could happen for Trump. But also 
different ideas circulating about the possibility of a commission, whether independent of Congress or committees within Congress or some hybrid formula of that, investigating every uh, unexplored and uh, incomplete aspect of the 1-6 insurrection. And I've seen some uh, some critiques of the idea, some worries about the possibility that it uh, ends up doing nothing much uh, in terms of uh, holding anyone accountable because of the weird construction of such committees. Committees and commissions, we'll, we'll have to see what they come up with. But accompanying that possibility, and I guess because they believe they might actually uh, be harmed in any accounting that's taken of the 1-6 insurrection. Republicans now launch a new conspiracy theory in which Nancy Pelosi is chiefly responsible for the insurrection and the damage that followed from it by, per you know, this is how the, the conspiracy theory goes, by, by purposefully suppressing the Capitol Police Force's ability to gear up for and prepare ahead of time for and respond to the insurrection on the 6th. Um, I've never been clear on this, exactly why they thought that this would make sense. It's actually been circulating for a couple of weeks now, and each time I am amazed that they forget that another half, the other half of the Capitol complex, the Senate, the other house, was uh, in Republican hands at the time, uh, I'm pretty sure that they knew that that was the case because they were busy running it the way they saw fit and uh, and then couldn't be bothered, of course, to consider the impeachment of Donald Trump during that time because reasons. And anyway, uh, the Republicans and Mitch McConnell, being the uh, the majority leader over there, would have been responsible for the Senate half of Capitol complex security, how it is that Nancy Pelosi ran roughshod over him during this period and caused the Capitol Police to stand down, as it were, is uh, unexplained and unclear. But it doesn't matter. It's a conspiracy theory. All there needs to be is the theory. But I saw at least uh, someone discussing it yesterday that gave me the opportunity to respond to the prompt. And now this morning, I see Dave Weigel discussing the same issue with a, a short thread about how ridiculous the theory is, of course, um, and saying this thread, he, he retweets another person's thread, a, a kooky person who I see Armando also poking fun at this morning. This thread captures the emerging Reichstag fire theory uh, that Pelosi purposefully rejected security so that the Capitol could be attacked. Unsure how her support for, for instance, a 9-11 commission-style probe into the attack fits into this. And it's the this time the work of one J. Michael Waller, who is, and I don't know who the hell this person is and doesn't really make any difference who it might be, but he's a, uh, a lunatic floating this theory of this cover-up uh, now underway to to hide the fact that Nancy Pelosi purposefully created the situation in which the Capitol Police security would be inadequate to take on the rioters on the 6th. But uh, Dave pointing out here, uh, honestly, this feels inevitable. If an event seems to benefit one party politically, a conspiracy theory develops that the party secretly planned the event. Same fever dreams happened after Oklahoma City bombing and, more famously, after 9-11. He then goes on to say conspiracy theories also work better if they seem familiar. Pelosi giving some sort of stand-down order, for instance, to let a riot happen. Shades of the, did Clinton issue a stand-down order and let Benghazi happen? It's a cozy conspiracy blanket. And uh, that prompted me to uh, remark, as I did yesterday under similar circumstances, that uh, this is, in fact, a familiar refrain and a, a, a conspiracy theory, the basic uh, bare bones of the same conspiracy theory that Republicans have used a number of times before, not only with Benghazi, but my 
uh, chief recollection of it, and maybe one of the more ridiculous uh, iterations of it, was in 2009 when Obama was brand new to the White House and, uh, and, and uh, well, we were beginning to reckon with, or it looked like we would begin to reckon with the Iraq War and its planning and the detainee policies, indefinite detention, maybe a little bit of the wireless, uh, warrantless wiretapping, although we mostly gave that issue away in the intervening years between 2005, uh, end of 2004 and 2009, but also torture policies. And when torture policies were coming to the fore, because at the time we were learning stories about how the Bush-Cheney administration had loosed various forces working inside of Iraq, and in particular in Baghdad, to uh, capture locals and try and coerce confessions from them that Al-Qaeda, even if it wasn't necessarily uh, behind the Saddam Hussein regime from the beginning, which didn't make any particular sense, but that they were now currently active in and had a hand in running things inside of Baghdad and are continuing problems there in pacifying Baghdad and, and wider Iraq were, according to this Bush-Cheney theory, the fault of al-Qaeda operatives, for which there was no evidence, uh, which is another familiar refrain, I guess, with conspiracy theories and Republican ones in particular. Anyway, the, uh, the story was breaking at that time uh, that, uh, that uh, I don't know, various uh, intelligence operatives and on-the-ground forces of various sorts were uh, torturing Iraqi locals to try to coerce confessions from them that al-Qaeda was, in fact, involved when they really weren't, and it was kind of ridiculous to think that they might be, given the dynamics of what was going on in Baghdad, that our biggest problems were coming from Shiite militia and not from the ultra-Orthodox, ultra-Sunni, anti-Shia Al-Qaeda operation. But hey, you know, besides that, who cares, right? Anyway, uh, at the time, the conspiracy theory was to lay this torture policy, or at least some responsibility for it, at Pelosi's feet. Amazingly enough. And the line was, what did Pelosi know about this torture and when did she know it? And the theory was built on the fact that she, as both as minority leader and as speaker, as leader of the House Democratic Caucus, would have been a member of the Gang of Eight, who were read into uh, all the security briefings uh, given by the intelligence community on Capitol Hill and that therefore she must have been aware of these programs and tacitly approved of them, which is not necess doesn't follow necessarily at all from being a member of the Gang of Eight. But they were very strongly pushing this theory that even if the Bush Cheney uh, regime had in fact been torturing Iraqis, it was still at least partially, if not mostly, Nancy Pelosi's fault because she knew about it and approved of it by refusing to put a stop to it, even from the minority and out of power and in the atmosphere, don't forget, of uh, post 9-11 and during the Iraq war when it was Republican public policy to accuse anybody who had questions about Republican public policy of favoring the terrorists in all of this. Some of you may remember that atmosphere. Um, but yeah, and I, I, it comes to mind for me because I remember it just distinctly because I made an appearance, one of, I don't know, maybe two or three appearances. This is like way back in the day when CNN was, uh, this was sort of an interesting dynamic all by itself. CNN had become vaguely aware of national interest in and the valuable content that could be provided by what they called blogs in those days. And they had caught up to the fact, I think, you know, like six, seven years into the, the hype, that 
uh, there were bloggers out there and that they were somewhat weird and sometimes had free time during the day and could be called upon to be gawked at and sometimes pointed and laughed at as being those political crazies that had real interest to our broadcast, except they weren't willing to actually risk actual CNN airtime on these exchanges. They created this uh, item called the the Blogger Bunch, just to you know put it, just to sort of underline the fact that uh, these were unserious people and they weren't to be taken seriously. But they talked about serious issues, but in goofy and stupid ways. And let's look at them and laugh at them. It was very disappointing really <laughs> and uh led to a lot of my loss of interest in participating in these things but uh, i bring that up only because uh this was uh, in many ways a precursor to the situation we find ourselves in many years later in the middle of our coronavirus pandemic where pundits of all kinds whether they're bloggers of no particular note or nationally known pundits, whatever, are, because of the pandemic, appearing on CNN and other cable news network channels from remote locations, from home. <clears throat> and that's become a common sight and people are used to it and they no longer have this weird reaction to it. But in the t at the time, in 2009 or so, it seemed like a novelty and... The, I guess, the policy, such as it was, I guess, could you call it policy, at Daily Coast at the time was anybody who was working for or in any way associated with Daily Coast as a as an operation, as a brand. We were, we, well, one, we got some media training for these purposes, but two, part of the policy was uh, don't, if you can help it, accept the opportunity, as easy and convenient as it might be, to appear on air via, you know, via uh, Skype or any other video conferencing service because uh, the, uh, the, well, what, the appearance on the air of appearing from your basement, from your kitchen, even from your home office, whatever. Now, of course, we know all about evaluating people in their Zoom backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera, Right. But at the time, if you, especially if you were appearing against a, you know, opposite a Republican pundit or on a panel like this one, this was the blogger bunch was four bloggers, two ostensibly two liberals and two conservatives thrown together. And uh, that the people who were appearing via Zoom, the video quality was poor, the camera angle was bad, the lighting was bad, there was no makeup, the background was sometimes very silly looking. Versus somebody appearing in suit and tie in the studio that gave visual cues to be taken more seriously. But it didn't matter because the whole thing was A, happening in a thing that they called the blogger bunch and B, happening only on CNN.com. They weren't actually giving over any cable news network time to it. And these things didn't air on the television version, the televised broadcast version of CNN. So... Uh, you were kind of behind the eight ball in a number of ways on the blogger bunch. But I made the effort to go into the Washington, D.C. CNN studios and put on the uh, official uniform of the pundit uh, just in order to lend as much credibility, visual credibility as I possibly could to my otherwise ridiculous appearance on CNN's air. Anyway, the first one I did, I think, was on this torture policy, and it went off the rails in a number of ways. Um, I don't remember who all of the rest of the panelists were, although I do remember that the other ostensible liberal, and I, I think she is uh, ordinarily a reliable liberal, was, uh, I remember her first name, Erica. And, and I, after that, I'm, I'm at a loss. And was it Erica Williams? Anyway, uh, she was, I think, working for the time uh, at the time at uh, Center for American Progress. Right. And so anyway, something of a, you know, an institutional organization. You all remember CAP and what it was all about anyway. And then there were two weirdos representing the right. I think one of them might have been a Washington Examiner columnist, which is one step up from being a blogger. Anyway, they threw us all in there together. And right away, it became clear that the Republican tack on this thing was literally what did Nancy Pelosi know? And when did she know it? 
Anyway, the theory was so stupid, as I was commenting on my recollection of it yesterday, the theory was so dumb that I decided, I say now I decided, but it was kind of an unconscious thing at the time, that uh, nobody should be allowed to talk in the rest of the segment but me. <laughs> this wasn't going to work. Uh, the theory was too stupid. The two idiots from the right were going to try carrying water for this thing. And then, as it turned out, Erica Williams, I think is her last name, uh, what had come with a prepared agenda about, you know, looking forward and what Democrats were going to do now that Barack Obama was in office and, uh, and at the time Democrats were uh, back in control in the, or still in control in the House, back in control in the Senate and or with an expanded majority. I forget what the, even the dynamics were. You do. You remember at the time. Anyway, and she meant to, I think, launch into, well, look, you know, despite this stupid made up controversy over what did Nancy Pelosi know and when did she know it, we have lots to do. The American people want to focus on X, Y, Z, and et cetera, et cetera. And a, a really, I think, ill-considered attempt to shift the agenda back over to looking forward to Democratic plans. I mean, that, that's the idea eventually, but we first needed to dispense with the really incredibly stupid and insulting idea that this torture policy was somehow Nancy Pelosi's fault. Well, anyway, I ended up uh, uh, practicing for this show and practicing really for the <laughs> for the Greg Dworkin role in the show. I just said, that's it. I'm the only one talking for the rest of this segment, and you're all idiots, and uh, how can you not see that what you're doing here is ridiculous? It doesn't even matter if the American people want to move on to a positive agenda from this point. The question laid out here by our our... our panel director from CNN is, what about torture? Don't lose focus on torture if you have a chance to talk about torture. Hi everybody, it's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Yeah, so uh, I don't know, probably spending too long on this whole thing, but uh, I do remember that uh, at the time that uh, this was the major... Uh, thesis of the Pelosi thing was the, not only uh, that Pelosi was at fault, and so it's been a long time. Like Nancy Pelosi has been at the at fault for everything in America, according to Republicans. For well, let's see. At least in this case, this would be good uh, 10, 11, 12 years so far, and probably longer than that. I mean, I guess at least until she, at least since she was became speaker following the 2006 elections, right? So, you know, what are we talking about? 15 years of blaming everything in the world, no matter how ridiculous, on Nancy Pelosi. Anyway, yeah, so I was just reacting to Dave Weigel's uh, pointing out that it, there has to be this element of uh, familiar comfort. And of course, the what did Pelosi know and when did she know it, even in 2009, was a fallback to the old, uh, well... Interesting, because it brings up a theory we were, or a, an old theme we were talking about yesterday about the tit for tat thing that Republicans were accusing people of when they were saying, "Oh, we ought to be at least thinking about impeaching George W. Bush and or Dick Cheney," and the theory was, "Oh, well, this is just tit for tat for the Clinton impeachment. You're not impeaching him, you know, for good reason, for any solid." reason, but rather because you're angry that Clinton was impeached and you want to get back at Republicans by impeaching their president. And now, of course, the people who said that at the time and how, I noted how ridiculous that was as an approach to public policy are busy backing Lindsey Graham's threat to impeach Kamala Harris as vice president 
you know, but none of that is tit for tat. That can't possibly be the case. Anyway, but uh, the what did Pelosi know and when did she know it was even in the language of it, a, a throwback to the <clears throat> legitimate uh, uh, formulation of that question, which was, of course, uh, was it Sam Irvin's formulation of the question? What did Nixon, what did the president know and when did he know it when it was you know, relevant to the investigation leading to his impeachment and then eventually to his resignation? Anyway, so they decided to revive that, and uh, I recall that they said it in that segment, and that was a popular theme in the right-wing press at the time, the emerging right-wing press, uh, still with us today and causing us problems. And I'm pretty sure that they actually phrased it that way on air. Now, as I I looked around, and I see that some of the rest of you have have looked around as well, Uh, John Godin here sending this along. Uh, I think this is the one just Googled it. Yeah, that's the uh, appearance that I did, except I don't think the video exists anywhere anymore. That was a major oversight on our part. This was video hosted by CNN. And at the time, the practice wasn't, it's still the practice, to, to simply link to that video. And everybody saw it at the time. It served the purpose. But as far as archiving the thing, I don't, you know, CNN didn't save it anywhere. They didn't even, you know, wasn't even deemed worthy of time on their actual cable network air at the time. So surely they didn't say, uh, maybe somewhere in a basement in CNN there exists a copy of this tape. Uh, and, and maybe in uh, the Wayback Machine somewhere, one of the many blogs that ended up posting this segment uh, it might still exist, but I don't think anybody saved, locally saved a copy of this thing. Although possibly Jed may have done it for, when he was working on the the uh, emerging the Jed report way back when. Uh, I should ask him about that. I wonder if I can uh, uh, sort of uh, tap his resources in that. Where where could I, I wonder if, if that's something he would have bothered to save from way back when. Anyway, uh, but he was sort of building a an experimental model of a multimedia daily coast platform that never really fully emerged, but it, it had, I, I think it was one of the first clips that he may have hosted on this hybrid platform that he was building. And uh, I think when we posted it on Daily Coast, we used it, you know, we relied on, on his server for serving the thing up. And anyway, it seems to be gone from every place. And even every blog that went over or, or posted about the exchange that happened on CNN uh, had ha- has since lost the video. It's simply missing from all of the posts that I've seen. But... Yeah, I mean, the reviews of it are out there. Uh, I have this to tell you. It was very well reviewed at the time. There's some very nice things being said about some people who will no longer say nice things about me, even if you ask, I think. So you can uh, take that to the bank, I guess. So John Godin, uh, JNG tweets, pointing out uh, one iteration of it from the blog. Maybe you remember this blog from the old blog spot days. Brilliant at breakfast. Do you remember this blog? This one, uh, well, there's some nice things and some some terrible things (laughs) being said about it. But I remember back in the days, Jane Hampshire and Fire Dog Lake had a lot to say about it. David Dayan, who might still say nice things about me. I say nice things about him all the time. uh, Also had a a good review of it. And I guess most famously in in this uh, portion of the discussion, which should really come to a close quickly honestly, and move on to the rest of the news, was from Glenn Greenwald, who I assume would no longer have anything nice to say about me because he doesn't have much nice to say about anybody these days. And uh, so we had such reviews when he was writing, back in the days when he was writing for Salon. Uh, He had such nice things to say about this. as Ah, and here's the answer. It was, in fact, Erica Williams was the name of the young lady who was on with me. And uh, what does he have to say about it? Last Friday... Who knows when that actually was? CNN hosted a panel debate, and it was CNN.com, hosted a panel debate on torture and investigations with two conservatives and two liberals, and the two liberals were uh, me, 
And yes, Center for American Progress is Erica Williams. And look at this. Waldman did a genuinely masterful job of arguing the case against torture and for investigations. And uh, that's nice. But then the real focus of his article is about how bizarrely, he says, the representative for CAP joined in with the two conservatives against Waldman to insist that there be no investigations. It was a little weird. It's true. This is what she said. So none of my <laughs> masterful job is captured here. But Erica Williams said uh, the American people right now are actually not interested in this sideshow and this discussion. The American people are interested in looking forward. Nobody is concerned anymore with what the Bush administration was doing and did. We decided it was torture. Conservatives may or may not disagree. None of that matters at this point in time. And, well, that was unfortunate. And later on, by the way, Williams uh, apologized, uh, not in the segment, but later on posted something and basically said, I don't know what happened to me. I, I had an agenda to get to, and I thought that was the only way to get around to it. But I realized, looking back on what I actually said, like, oh, my God, I absolutely did not mean that at all, which I don't know. At the moment, it didn't help very much. Uh, but she did later clarify. But lots of nice things said about it. And uh, uh, mostly it was just me being so incredulous that other people would even dare to, you know, step out and put themselves on camera and say things like, uh, one, it wasn't that big of a deal, but even if it was, it was Nancy Pelosi's fault it was just too much for me. And so therefore, no one else got to talk. I believe I spent some time comparing the Bush-Cheney torture policies uh, to the Spanish Inquisition, <laughs> which incensed, I think, the Washington Examiner guy, who was uh, referred to in some of the concurrent narratives uh, as bow tie guy. Uh, you know, the, the Washington Examiner sent their guy in a bow tie. The other conservative blogger, as I recall, was wearing like a, you know, a, a, a red shirt and a black and red tie, but had hung an American flag as his then prototype, you know, Zoom, actually Skype background. And uh, it made for, uh, well, it, it really looked kind of ridiculous. Anyway, <clears throat> so uh, that was an interesting exchange. So, uh, yeah, they, uh, how dare you, con you know, this, that, compare to the, why the Spanish Inquisition, how dare you, on behalf of the American soldiers, I am uh, incensed. And, of course, American soldiers weren't even, uh, accused of being involved in the in the situation, so it was in opposite from the beginning. Anyway, <clears throat> you get the idea, and uh, they've been doing the when did what did she know and when did she know it ploy for a very long time, and and it's tit for tat, which is exactly what they say they're against. And uh, now, uh, fast forward to the modern era, I guess. I think we're done with this. I don't know, except for asking Jed whether he has video of the segment anywhere. I don't know. I think in hindsight, it, it sounded really good. Maybe we should just leave it with the uh, written reviews of it because I bet that uh, 10, 12 years ago on video, uh, I must have looked like a scatterbrain. Uh, but I was angry about torture, so I looked pretty good at the time instead. All right, let's see. Other things to share with you. Uh, how about something else that isn't news but is interesting? sort of, and uh, is uh, about our history. How about that? Um, oh, and by the way, yes, I have to acknowledge uh, Ricky May uh, chiming in about the Texas situation, saying, yes, there is snow and ice in Texas. Wow, but there's no such thing as climate change. Definitely true, uh, and definitely a part of their infrastructure plans and their focus on fossil fuels. They sort of think this can go on forever and they don't need to spend any infrastructure money uh, uh, preparing for eventualities that they've never encountered before and that were kind of considered off the charts because reasons and nothing's changing. And so we don't need to worry about things that we've never experienced before. I mean, I agree that, say, installing, a, you know, uh, large furnaces in everybody's home is probably not exactly what's called for, but certainly a more robust electrical grid would probably work. Speaking of robust electrical grids, uh, you probably saw circulating yesterday that video from down in Texas of, I don't know what the hell was going on. I guess a power line had been knocked down somewhere and caused some kind of major damage. And there were these huge electrical, like blue light electrical surges surging down 
electrical wires that were still strung up from somewhere where I guess a transformer had blown up or whatever it was that would cause such a problem. Very frightening. So uh, it looks like the electrical grid could probably use some work down there in Texas, but uh, not with any taxes or at the expense of any corporations. Thank you very much. Somehow that's supposed to work out. Anyway, uh, in uh, I said uh, I will offer you something that, uh, by way of segue, just to get out of this segment, something else that doesn't have anything to do with current events, but is kind of interesting and plays off of something we discussed yesterday. We had a little bit of short discussion about the Roman calendar yesterday with Greg, who was teaching us what the Ides of a month actually uh, is, are, what they are, Ides, collectively. And uh, we learned a little something there. And then I got to thinking about how yesterday was President's Day and what the hell is that anyway? And it's the combination we had, you know, Lincoln's birthday and Washington's birthday both fell in February and for whatever reason, we decided that they were two presidents who needed to have their birthdays marked, and that's a history thing, and I think we all you know, are generally in agreement, but I think, at this stage, even though oh, out in San Francisco they might disagree at the school board. But anyway, they eventually combined the two of them and said, uh, they're no longer as important to us, or it's too much of an inconvenience, or people are getting too much time off of work, or something. And now we have President's Day, which is neither of their birthdays, but it's in the neutral territory in between. Anyway, I got to wondering, uh, what was the actual date of Washington's birthday and the actual date of Lincoln's birthday? Because <clears throat> I, I imagine school kids of your, that would be old people, school kids of your might remember those from the days that we were marked individually. Um so what's George Washington's birthday? And I stumbled upon this interesting bit of New England Today, uh, newengland.com, an article from February, uh, appropriately, 2018, why George Washington had two birthdays, footnote to history. Interesting. <clears throat> and comes under the heading both of footnote to history and humor somehow. Can you imagine having two birthdays every year? Learn more about the curious case of George Washington's double birthdays. And I don't think I'd ever heard this story. I wondered whether it was like the wooden teeth. Not quite really true. Well, Judson D. Hale has answered the question. We'll see whether we believe him. That's right. Birthdays with an S. Can you imagine having two birthdays every year? A lot of people would love it. Well, for 47 of his 67 years, George Washington did. And one of them was made of wood, probably. The first was on the date on which he was born in 1732, February 11th. Right? I mean, I guess so. It says so. But wait, wasn't his birthday always on February 22nd? And I think that's what the school kids of yore were taught. Unless you were in school in the 1730s or, well, more importantly, 1750s, as you'll find out. And this sounds like the plot subplot of a, uh, one of the National Treasure movies. At some point, this is going to come up. Well, <clears throat> wasn't Washington's birthday always on February 22nd? Not always. How could that be? In 1752, you see, when George Washington was 20, Great Britain adopted the new improved calendar instituted by Pope Gregory XIII late in the 16th century and proceeded to impose it on us as we were then colonies of Great Britain, which is an odd thing altogether, really. Uh, by that point, Great Britain would probably have been less concerned with what any pope, Gregory the Thirteenth or otherwise, uh, had been doing. And of course, if it happened in the late 16th century, that would be the 15, late 1500s, it's now 1752. And England is saying, not only have we uh, broken with the Roman Church, but uh, whatever, we're going to adopt the calendar that they began using 200 years ago, 150 perhaps, uh, closer to 150 years ago, uh, because reasons. And, and there was a reason. I don't know what the holdout reason was. Maybe it was the break away from the Roman Church that was the holdout reason. So an early Brexit from the uh, calendar regime sweeping Europe at the time, I guess. I don't know how other people, other countries did with adopting the Gregorian calendar. But 
This newly imposed Gregorian calendar, as it became known, fixed the length of the solar year at 365 days, to which was added one day every four years, if said year was divisible by four, i.e. leap years. Okay, so we all understand leap years, I think. The switch to the Gregorian calendar from the old Julian calendar, named for Julius Caesar, uh, who would have been more familiar with the Ides of things, and in particular, at least briefly, with the Ides of March. Hmm. Uh, well, this switch was because the old calendar had become, and this is a technical term here, out of whack relative to the sun's and earth's cycles by 10 whole days. I guess they didn't have leap years, and that discrepancy piles up at some point. And somehow we were 10 days off from whatever the hell it was we measured where we were supposed to be by the Julian calendar. So the uh, by 1752, it was in fact off by 11 whole days. So I guess that was enough to move Great Britain to action. And that year, they made the switch. Now, what did they do? How did they, This is a really wacky situation. I mean, it's weird enough that we deal with a February 29th every four years. And of course, if somebody's birthday falls on a, on a year and a leap year when there's a February 29th, we always wonder how they celebrate their birthdays and do they do it on February 28th or on March 1st? And I still don't know the answer, even though one of my own nephews has that exact problem. And I don't know which day they picked uh, for celebrating his birthday, but we always, you know, take every opportunity on leap years to say, congratulations, you're two or, or three or whatever. But if you think that's weird, check out what happened in 1752. In 1752, they're off by 11 days. So those 11 days, they simply dropped them that year. Isn't that crazy? So 1752, there was a February... First, the day following February 1st, 1752, was not February 2nd, 1752. It was February 11th, 1752, to catch up with the new calendar, right? So George Washington's old birthday on February 11th jumped all the way to February 22nd. Isn't that, that is something. I mean, I guess that year it would jump but, I mean, I guess you could say, well, I'll just have my birthday on whatever the, the, the second day of February is this year. And then next year, I'll go back to the 11th day of February. But I don't know. They decided to do both, I guess. Although, at first, the uh, many colonial communities refused to go along with this. We, we, we weren't paying taxes. We won't use your calendar. George Washington apparently took the change in stride and from 1752 on accepted February 22nd as his birthday. On the other hand, he didn't completely ignore his old February 11th birthday. For instance, in 1799... He attended a gala birthday party in his honor in Alexandria, Virginia on February 11th, writing in his diary that night that he, quote, went up to Alexandria for the celebration of my birthday, which is the natural thing to write in your diary if you have in fact done that. Eleven days later, on February 22nd, 1799, he celebrated his second birthday of that year, which turned out to be the last of his life. He died 10 months later on the evening of December 14th, 1799. I think, says our author, that it's ironic today we don't really celebrate either one of George Washington's two February birthdays. The closest we come is our celebration of President's Day on the third Monday in February. Incidentally, Abraham Lincoln's birthday is on February 12th this year, as it was in 2018, and I guess this year as well. Actually, it's always on February 12th. I like it better that way, and one birthday a year is probably enough. So there you go. That's actually quite interesting. Uh, but uh, I think uh, something to keep in mind for trivia, right? So again, this could appear <clears throat> in like a, a national treasure, <clears throat> pardon me, a national treasure movie or something quite like it. Um, and I imagine it would be something along the lines of finding a document 
that was dated or purported to be dated February 5th, 1752. And the characters would slowly come to the realization that there was no February 5th, 1752. And that's how we know it's a, a latter day forgery or uh, I guess in the case of National Treasure, that would be some sort of uh, Masonic clue that you should pour lemon juice on the other side of the document to reveal a, a secret diagram of where the treasure was or something like that. Otherwise, the idea of it being a latter-day forgery would be, be, be more like an Encyclopedia Brown mystery being solved that way. So remember that, 1752. How was the period? What was the weather like in Texas from February 2nd through the well, 10th? of 1752 and the answer is there was no weather in texas uh at that time not only because there was no texas i mean the land was there but i don't think it was called texas uh but because there was no february 2nd through 10th 1752 unless mexico at that point under the i guess spanish uh, uh empire was the spanish were the Spanish using the Gregorian calendar considerably earlier than the British? Probably. We could look that up. This has nothing to do with anything, but I somehow felt like we needed a break from current events. Not that there's any less events happening currently. And at this point, probably time to start setting things up for our discussion of that when Joan comes by. If she even recognizes this show anymore, she might be listening and just saying, well, clearly this is not something... Uh, they need me for. But yes, in fact, we do to get our feet back beneath us uh, with what's happening on COVID relief and the larger picture. If you know anything about this one, Joan, I'd be interested uh, of what's happening with uh, some of the large programs, safety net programs in the upcoming budget, because there are some strange budgetary tricks going on. And Need some explanation. I have here, why don't we just move to that, from a few days ago, this would be uh, Friday of last week, I noticed this Politico article and <clears throat> wondered what uh, to make of it, and perhaps Joan has some thoughts on it. I think she's written something that touches on the subject from a slightly different angle, and we might want to compare the two and figure out what's going on. Ready? Biden's stimulus gamble. We figured there'd be a gamble going on somewhere. Massive cuts to Medicare, comma, farm aid. Hmm. Is this an accurate reflection of what's going on? It's the sort of headline that seems designed to worry us greatly, not so much necessarily about farm aid, depending on what the aid is and, and uh whether it seems legit or whether it's just a uh, suspension of the weird giveaways that Trump was doing for farmers uh, during pandemic, etc. But what's going on here? What about Medicare? The budget gambit Democrats are embracing to fast track Joe Biden's one point nine trillion dollar pandemic aid will trigger billions of dollars in re. Well, it says reeducations, but I think probably reallocations is what they meant. But spell check, change it to re-educations, and they didn't notice. Reallocations to critical programs. Caitlin Emma is the writer here, and I have a feeling just from the header and subheader that we're going to find that there's a very different spin on things here than we might find uh, at Daily Coast. Let's, let's find out what they have to say here. The budget gambit Democrats are embracing to fast track the pandemic aid plan will trigger billions of dollars in cuts to critical programs. Will they be made up elsewhere? Let's find out. Top Democrats are already shrugging off the threat, insistent that Congress will once again act in time to head off the slashing of programs like Medicare and farm subsidies, subsidies a byproduct of using the reconciliation process, which always causes problems somewhere. There's always a trade-off for getting around the filibuster. Except, by the way, if you just blow up the filibuster and go straight at it. That's just straightforward. Anyway, in that high stakes trust fall, get it? The trust fall, right? Catch me. Uh, Democrats will be relying on the Senate Republicans. They are now spurning. And that might be a point that carries over and might become a big deal later on. 
The threat stems from limitations enacted in 2010 under, oh gosh, pay-as-you-go rules, which require Congress to offset the cost of each piece of legislation. At best, Republicans could use their votes to avert the impending cliff as leverage to notch GOP policy wins in negotiations later this year. At worst, they could let the cuts set in as punishments to Democrats for using the reconciliation tool to negotiate Republican input as the majority party pushes to advance Biden's package with just 51 votes in the Senate. I don't know whether to be concerned or not. House Budget Chair John Yarmuth said in an interview, I've been told not to be concerned. That's nice. But I mean, I thought that the chairman of the Budget Committee is the one who should be telling people whether or not to be concerned, as opposed to just saying, I don't know, somebody told me I didn't have to be. The fix could be as easy as inserting language in must-pass legislation before the cuts set in come mid-January, which I guess is... Uh, next year is January, as Congress has previously done with little fanfare. And it does happen that way occasionally. Unlike a reconciliation bill, however, that solution can't pass the Senate with a simple majority and requires 10 Senate Republicans to sign off. Everybody seems to not worry about it, Yarmouth said. I don't know. I've been told it's pretty much perfunctory that we'll get it done, which is, sounds like the death knell if you ask me. Uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell's office did not respond to two requests for comments about what? About whether Republicans would help wave off the gouges to mandatory spending that stem from Biden's pandemic aid plan. And I can see already how this will set up, right? Democrats will say, well, we need Republican cooperation to uh, avoid this. But and uh, Republicans are threatening not to help with it, in which case it will be their fault for letting it happen. And whereas Republicans will say, no, actually, it's your fault for triggering the thing in the first place. We'll be back. All right. Welcome back now to the K-Girl in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's continue with the Politico piece. I've already uh, I've been scrolling just to make sure I, I found uh, all of Jones latest pieces. And uh, there is certainly some discussion of Medicaid at some point here, but uh, I'm not certain whether it uh, overlaps with this or not, because I haven't had a chance to read through the piece, but uh, it'll be very interesting to see what she's got to say about this and what the plan might be. This has kind of caught me by surprise here. Uh, where were we? Senate Minority Leader McConnell's office director didn't respond about whether or not basically they're going to be of any help in trying to restore these cuts, but I still don't really understand exactly what has made them necessary. In ordinary times, it would be almost certain that Republicans would go along with it, said David Wessel, a director at the centrist Brookings Institution. But these aren't ordinary times, and you can't be sure that Republicans would go along with this, said Wessel, who heads the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy at Brookings. I think there's a small but significant risk that the Republicans would use this as leverage to get something from the Democrats. And that's usually the way they work. Both parties have repeatedly voted to waive the rule and avoid the cuts with other major reconciliation packages. Democrats joined Republicans to avert $150 billion in cuts that would have been prompted by the 2017 tax overhaul, including a $25 billion chunk for Medicare. The Congressional Budget Office at the time determined that certain programs, like the Public Health and Prevention Fund uh, under Obamacare, would have been virtually wiped out. Lawmakers simply, uh, similarly stopped any slicing when it came to Obama-era stimulus legislation and multiple tax cut packages under George W. Bush. Some on Capitol Hill say times have changed, however. I'm still not clear on the mechanism that's forcing the cuts, but I know that reconciliation forces some weird uh, maneuverings, not only, of course, uh, trying to make things fit under the Byrd rule, but in the Senate in particular, uh, making them uh, fit in the 10-year budget window uh, and uh, accounting for any uh, increases in the deficit uh, over the 10 years sometimes requires making gigantic slashes 
from some part of the budget in order to bring the budget, you know, more or less back into balance, not adding to the national debt and the federal deficit after the 10-year window closes, 10 years in the future after the passage of this re proposed reconciliation bill. Sometimes they just need to uh, make things come into balance and they use an accounting trick of saying, well, where's the biggest pot of money we can find? And very often it's in uh, these uh, safety net programs. And they say, well, theoretically, in order to make things work under reconciliation, we'll balance this out by having the $10 billion we need to find come out of Medicaid. But it comes out of Medicaid in, you know, year 10 or whatever, year two or later, whatever, just not now and give ourselves this much time to find ways to make up that gap. In the meantime, though, we've fulfilled the requirements of reconciliation, gotten around the filibuster and legislated as we've needed to, but now we have to come up with something. And you know, I don't know whether it was reconciliation that caused it, but I, it brings to mind the uh, trouble we had kicking the, the old Medicare doc fix down the road several years and each year for a couple of years in a row we faced this possibility of an incredible slashing of reimbursements to doctors under medicare that was somehow untenable and ordinarily and ordinary times was very easily fixable but blah 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 blah, blah. republicans didn't want to cooperate and i think we might find ourselves right back in the same spot and isn't it wise not to go down that route well sure but I imagine that the, ultimately what this comes down to is in order to avoid that, you got to avoid the filibuster somehow, whether it's use of reconciliation or simply just saying, that's it, no more legislative filibuster. We can't do it. It just can't be tolerated anymore. Uh, but then the question is, how do you bring a Joe Manchin or Christian Cinema along with you on that? And I still can't remember whether I have her first name right or not. Uh, all right. Well, anyway, she uh, poses a particular problem. Uh, that, too, a subject of Joan's recent writing. Uh, and we'll check in with her on that. So lots of questions stemming from this Politico piece. So it's, I guess, a good setup. Uh, where were we? All uh, right. The trouble with Republicans helping us. Uh, if they can pin the blame successfully enough or successfully enough for their purposes on Democrats, would they let people suffer in order to score political points against Democrats? Yes, of course, they absolutely would. They would love to do that. That's actually their primary policy. So <laughs> there's really no issue for them. Whereas when the shoe is on the other foot, Democrats usually say, well, uh, can we let lots and lots of very vulnerable people suffer, but thereby score political points against Republicans? And very often the answer is, uh, well, it's, that's just not right. We're going to have to. It's going to look like we're giving in, perhaps, and other people might encourage us to stand and fight because surely Republicans wouldn't allow this harm to come to that many people. Uh, I think I think we're all dissuaded of that by now. I mean, we're passing the threshold of uh, 500,000 dead from coronavirus. Uh, I think we can be pretty sure that Republicans will, in fact, attempt to score political points uh, over suffering and death, with suffering and death, using suffering and death to do it. So the article continues with the question, are we going to find 10 Senate Republicans to prevent these cuts after they've found Jesus again on the national debt? Let's be real. The aide, a one House Democratic aide who's being asked about these things, uh, said in a statement, oh, and in fact, I think we missed one uh, prior statement from the same House Democratic aide. Although Democrats swooped in to protect Medicare and other programs from significant cuts after Republicans used reconciliation to pass tax cuts for the wealthy, we need to be realistic that Republicans are less likely to do the same for us. And I think that's right, said this one House Democratic aide who is remaining anonymous and then reiterating the point, uh, as we just heard in that second paragraph, about the uh, will Republicans prevent these cuts after they've found Jesus again on the national debt? Eh, not a particularly uh, fair way of putting. I mean, it's fair to say that they 
flip-flop all the time on the national debt. But I don't think that Jesus had anything to do with it. Probably not involved in their thinking at all, and really unfair to involve him in the discussion, if you ask me. Anyway, this is not a concern, said a senior Democratic aide. How do you like that? Two other senior Democratic aides here chime in and dismiss the threat, saying worries about the cuts going into effect have not been raised as both the House and Senate pull together the particulars of the Biden bill. This is not a concern. This is not something we're concerned about because we know that every time this problem has come up in the past, it has always been corrected. That sounds like a bad bet. Provisions to avert the cuts could be added to must-pass legislation like annual spending bills, ensuring it would be politically costly for Republicans to vote against waiving off the reductions. I see what you mean. And wrong spelling of waiving here, by the way. Um, if you could waive those reductions, or, but if you're going to waive them off, there's no I, except the second one in ING. But okay. So, they're prepared to shut down the government in exchange for cuts, the aid asked. No one is going to allow Medicare or farm worker programs to be cut because of the reconciliation bill. That I can guarantee you. Oh boy. Feels like a super committee. Democrats are also considering the use of reconciliation twice this session. Yes, it can be done. Once to pass Biden's pandemic aid plan, and then again to push through a massive climate and infrastructure package. That legislation would also add to the cuts Congress must avoid. Doubling the problem, I guess. Matthew Dickerson, a director at the Conservative Heritage Foundation, said Republicans could offer their support for preventing the reductions in exchange for more measured steps to reducing the nation's debt and deficit. Finding Jesus or choose your deity here. Uh, like an agreement to curb spending on mandatory programs. It's a useful leverage point for Republicans, said Dickerson, who runs the, who cares, Grover M. Herman Center for the Federal Budget. We can't keep spending at the rate that we're spending. Sure we can. Uh, we've explained a number of times how we can and why we should. But, you know, uh, this, is the, this is the whole finding Jesus thing or finding Jesus again thing. It's a metaphor. Jesus, again, has nothing to do with this and probably would approve of that spending regardless of the national debt. Okay. So that sets up some interesting discussion if Joan is prepared to answer that or discuss that and find out where we stand and what we might expect from this. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is uh, more to do with January 6th, though we can skip some of that. What else did we want to head back to and uh, add to the conversation before we hear, uh, you know what, we might as well also set up some of the discussion about the uh, filibuster, because that will obviously be a major portion of our discussion. So basically about everything going forward from here on in. And I'll, I'll grab going back, oh, I don't know, two weeks or so. Is this right? February 9th. Okay, not quite that far back from CNN. Uh, Ron Brownstein's piece here uh, on, how does he put it, the Senate's coming crisis over majority rule. The early lines of division between the parties during Joe Biden's presidency point toward rising confrontation sooner rather than later over rules and traditions in the Senate that empower the minority to block the majority. I think you know what we're talking about here. The quick turn by Biden and congressional Democrats toward reliance on the special reconciliation procedure for passing their COVID-19 rescue package, and maybe some other things later on, with only 51 Senate votes underscores their conviction that in today's highly polarized environment, they are unlikely to secure support for anything close to their plan from 10 Senate Republicans, the number they would need to break a GOP filibuster. Yet, by relying on the reconciliation process to pass that priority, Democrats may only raise more questions about whether they should sustain other venerable Senate procedures. It's not that venerable, including the filibuster and deference to home state senators on judicial nominations that I know Joan is ready to talk about blue slips that impede majority rule and provide the minority a virtual veto on many fronts. Though the Senate has trimmed back 
rules that empower the minority party to block the majority. It has not completely eliminated procedures such as the filibuster, you know all about that one, or the blue slip system that has allowed senators from the opposite party to veto judicial nominations in their home states. Over the next two years, those Senate procedures enabling minority rule are likely to face some more pressure than ever, face more pressure than ever, as Democrats and their allied interest groups face the prospect of Republicans using them to slow or derail any of their plans that can't be shoehorned into the complex reconciliation process from a new Voting Rights Act to Citizenship for Dreamers uh, to the $15 minimum a federal minimum wage, which Biden acknowledged to CBS this weekend, actually last last weekend, probably won't pass muster under the reconciliation process, though the House is prepared to go ahead with it regardless. They don't have the same bird rule problem. As the parties joust over these ideas in the coming months, the Senate procedure's frustrating majority rule may become even more controversial because the chamber's basic structure, which provides each state two senators regardless of population, now creates such dramatic partisan distortions. Though each party holds 50 Senate seats, the Republicans' reliance on smaller, preponderantly white and heavily rural interior states means that if you assign half of each state's population to each senator— Democrats represent nearly 42 million more Americans than Senate Republicans. Senate rules that provide an effective veto to a legislative minority would face growing pressure under any circumstances, but when that veto is exercised on behalf of such a distinct minority of the population, the pressure is certain to grow only more intense. While the convoluted reconciliation process offers a temporary workaround to the problem of minority rule in the Senate, that's a very limited answer, says Democratic Representative David Price of North Carolina, who's also a political scientist and recently published an updated edition of his book, The Congressional Experience, An Institution Transformed. Nice title. Before long, Price says, Democrats will have to confront head-on the underlying question of whether in this highly polarized era they can maintain the Senate procedures like the filibuster that allow the minority to block the majority's programs. If Democratic priorities that pass the House die in the Senate because of Republican filibusters, Price predicts, the pressures just become very intense for some kind of alteration of the Senate rules. I just think the notion that every bill, everything from gun control to dreamers, will be subject to filibuster becomes intolerable at that point. And the question is, what can we find that would be intolerable, literally intolerable, to cinema and mansion to get them on board with changing filibuster rules? And uh, my early proposition was, my early guess was, what if it's the organizing resolution? What if it's the resolution that keeps the gavel out of mansion's hands that he thought he was going to come into, except... They seem to have transitioned rather easily at the Energy and Commerce. Is that right? Is that the name of their committee? The uh, Energy and Natural Resources Committee and handed things over pretty quickly. I think largely because there was a actual Democratic majority right from the get-go, even without an organizing resolution in that committee. But no one but me was talking about that. Anyway, the filibuster, in fact more and more resembles a vestige of an earlier era as Congress transforms into something like the kind of parliamentary system used abroad in such nations as the United Kingdom or Germany, in which the majority party controls the agenda, the minority party opposes it, and both dissension within the parties and cooperation between them are rare. The filibuster and other Senate rules favoring the minority creates a contradictory dynamic, a parliamentary system where the majority cannot rule. If you have a minority party that will not cooperate, and if you have a Senate that has the rules that it does, then you're going to end up with the inability to focus on the major issues that face the society, says Norm Ornstein, a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, who is a co-author of It's Even Worse Than It Looks, a 2012 book about congressional dysfunction. 
Concern about the congressional rules that allow minorities to block action, what political scientists call the system's anti-majoritarian tendencies, was common in the first decades after World War II. In those years, both parties were riven by ideological divides that separated northern liberal Democrats from deeply conservative southern Democrats and moderate to liberal coastal Republicans from staunchly conservative Midwestern ones. In that era of what they have in quotes here as four-party politics, as it was known, the informal alliance of Southern Democrats and Midwestern Republicans, a conservative coalition symbolized by segregationist Democratic Senator Richard Russell of Georgia and isolationist Republican Senator Robert Taft of Ohio, often held a veto over legislative action, no matter which party controlled the White House or the Senate majority. In a landmark 1950 report, the American Political Science Association called for restructuring congressional rules to allow the majority party more leverage to implement its agenda. That process began in the 1960s. It actually, I think, began a little earlier than that, and just in terms of efforts at filibuster reform from what was then the Progressive Coalition, the Progressive Caucus in the Senate, which again... Uh, counted members of both parties and from several different regions. Uh, but they began their efforts to reform the filibuster in the late 1950s, just as a historical footnote. Uh, here, though, the discussion begins with a process beginning in the 1960s. In a key early step, House Democrats enlarged membership in the chamber's rules committees to ease the hammerlock that the conservative coalition, led by longtime chairman, Judge Howard W. Smith, uh, not an actual judge, I guess it's in scare quotes, but they called him the judge, a Virginia Democrat, exercised there over President John F. Kennedy's agenda. In the 1970s, liberal Democratic reformers led by the late Representative Richard Bowling of Missouri finally overthrew the seniority system that allowed conservative Southerners to control key committees while opposing most of the party's agenda and instead empowered the party caucus to elect committee chairs, which incentivized more party loyalty. And, of course, leadership packs, which brought their own problems with them, as you know. It's an interesting. It's just, again, take note of this, because every once in a while we have one of these discussions where we say there needs to be a reform of X, Y, Z, and complain about it. And uh, only rarely, I guess on this show, uh, every once in a while we come to realize, hey, this thing that we are saying is ossified and demands reform was not that long ago a reform itself, replacing some other previous and equally ossified system that we had to get rid of, uh, which is interesting because it then casts our reformers as incrementalists, unwitting and perhaps unwilling incrementalists, uh, even though they sometimes will... Uh, vehemently deny that they are incrementalists and reject that label. But uh, moving from the seniority system to elected committee chairs, uh, that requires more party loyalty, but that also brings along with it the power of, in some cases, corporate PAC fundraising. Uh, that deserves uh, some reform as well. But uh, uh, like we said, probably at the time they didn't realize they were being incrementalist, but it should be creeping up on them now. When Republicans gained the House majority after 1994, they employed these powers more aggressively than Democrats ever did and took other steps to centralize power over legislative action in each chamber's leadership. Georgia's Newt Gingrich, boo. The House GOP speaker in the 1990s, probably more than any other individual, envisioned Congress's transition to a more parliamentary-like system defined by greater unity within the parties and relentless conflict between them. But when Democrats regained the House majority after 2006, and again after 2018, they largely maintained the Gingrich changes that centralized control and encouraged majority rule. And it was interesting, too, at the time, because, of course, everybody basically said, this is our time, our chance to flex our muscles and do the things we want to do, except we weren't yet quite united in what those things were and how we wanted to do them and why we wanted to do them. Um, but uh, the the 
opportunity to do so was attractive enough for us to do. And uh, the alternative of throwing things back into uh, looser and more decentralized mode uh, might have been attractive to some, but the prospect of then passing our own agenda would probably be, would have been that much more distant at the time. <clears throat> it was an interesting dynamic, to say the least. I'm glad this is uh, being brought up here. The march has been pretty steadily toward more polarized parties, which is to say homogeneous within and distanced from each other and a more centralized institution, says Price. The Senate's trajectory, though, has been more uneven. During the 1970s, the parties also ended reliance on seniority for naming Senate committee chairs, though they have exercised that power more rarely than in the House. And during the 1970s, senators lowered the threshold for breaking the filibuster from 67 votes to 60, theoretically a step toward majority rule. The offsetting factor was that after the 1970s, the use of the filibuster steadily became more routine, with Republicans in particular creating a 60-vote threshold for almost anything Democratic presidents Bill Clinton and especially Barack Obama sought to pass. Before we move on from this to the next paragraph. I want to pause here in this one. First of all, yes, it was during the 1970s that they lowered the threshold. But again, this was an effort that began in the mid to late 1950s. And many, many efforts at making that change only succeeding at last in 1975. Just to give you some idea of how long it took to reform the filibuster the first time, it probably, I think you could pin it at, at or almost 20 years of efforts in the Senate, chiefly, I guess, and maybe the big mistake was centering all of this around the idea, I guess, the fairness idea that the rules ought to be the same throughout the entirety of the Congress and that it would be on the first day of a new Congress uh, that they ought to make these changes. And there were some other theoretical underpinnings to that, which have since been abandoned. But if you're a longtime listener to the show, you will remember exactly where that idea came from. But anyway, I guess for now, the point will stand that in the 1950s, like 55, 56, they began attempting to make these changes on the first day of a new Congress with Richard Nixon, Vice President Richard Nixon in the chair. And uh, he actually facilitated a lot of this fight, I guess from back in the days when, you know, uh, there was that four-party politics situation going on. Uh, now, I guess you would never expect to see that from a Republican vice president. Uh, but even so, it still took until 1975, until Richard Nixon had moved on to the White House, to which he was elected twice and eventually had to resign. It wasn't until he was all the way through his presidency and out the back door into the helicopter once again, and gone from American politics, that they actually succeeded in bringing down the threshold of the filibuster from 67 votes to 60. And here, another important point I want to slip in is that um, the use of the, they do note here that the use of the filibuster becomes steadily more routine and da 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 da, 60 vote threshold. One other thing that doesn't get mentioned here a whole lot, and I'm not certain that it would have made such a huge difference. But at the time it did, because, uh, again, Senate culture was a little bit different in terms of showing up for votes. But the one of the compromises from the anti-reform group that ended up screwing this up even worse was that when the filibuster threshold was 67 votes, in other words, a two-thirds vote was necessary to cut off debate in the Senate. The two thirds was counted by a different metric. It was two thirds of senators present and voting. That is two thirds of whoever was there that day and had showed up to cast a vote, which is a different thing and creates a different dynamic than the standard that they went to. The, the anti-reform gang extracted this concession. All right, we'll move it from 67 votes or two thirds down to three-fifths. They really, uh, you know, the rule itself just 
made a change in the fraction. It didn't pinpoint the number anywhere because you never know whether the ranks of the Senate are going to increase with the admission of new states or anything like that. But the uh, basically the deal was this. They'll move from two-thirds of those present and voting down to three-fifths, but it's three-fifths of all senators, as they say, duly chosen and sworn. That is, all senators who are in office. And what that ended up creating was the situation in which if you didn't produce 60 or you could produce a minority that would make it impossible to get to 60, the filibuster wouldn't end. Whereas you had to have an actual live vote every time the other way. Hi, it's me, David Goldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning. I have good news to report. Many more listeners like you are making critical contributions that keep our show on the air. Makes good sense, of course, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple. Now you can make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for helping keep you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the K-Girl in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Joan McCarter joins us right on time. Uh, Forewarning that she gave me during the break. Internet is a little spotty today. I guess your internet provider is in Texas or something like that. <laughs> Maybe that's what's happening. Uh, how's, is it, do you have some weather issues there or just regular everyday internet? Well, the weather's passed. We had a okay. foot of snow over the weekend, but it's All fine right. now. So I don't know. Okay. Could be anything. Uh, but just in case, you know, something goes wrong or the sound isn't what it should be, everyone knows uh, what's going on. Don't panic. But, uh, okay, so let's see. Where I left off, I guess I'll just wrap up there by, uh, I might as well clear this up before we jump into the rest of this because you were beginning to explain to me what's going on with reconciliation and responding to the Politico article, and we definitely got to get to that. Uh, But I was just pointing out that one reform in 1975 of the filibuster that lowered the cloture threshold from two-thirds to three-fifths but changed the standard two-thirds of those present and voting to three-fifths of all senators duly chosen and sworn. The effect of that, I think, is what is generally behind the switchover from the either the old-fashioned talking filibuster or the uh, at least a filibuster and cloture test that required you to keep a large number of your minority filibustering senators close at hand to produce them in case of a vote on cloture uh, changed over to, well, if you know that you need to be able to produce 60 votes affirmatively, no matter what, no matter who's there in order to get past cloture, the minute you can get the assurance of 41 senators that they would vote against it. You can get to the just the silent filibuster sort of thing where you say, we definitely will filibuster this. And if you file for cloture and then wait for the cloture motion to ripen and then hold a vote, you will lose that vote. So don't even try as mm-hmm. opposed to, well, if it's two thirds of those present and voting, well, you better be sure that you have everybody there and they're going to have to show up and and demonstrate that they're on hand to block this bill as opposed to, well, we'll just assume that they're not going to be able to, to pull this off. So I don't know. That was uh, one of the changes, and that has had a major effect. And I don't know whether we could ever get them to, even as an interim, agree to, well, maybe it stays at three-fifths, but it's three-fifths of those present and voting rather than all duly chosen and sworn. I don't know that'll make a great deal of difference in the modern era, Generally speaking, when they call a vote, people are around to show up. Back in the day, I don't know whether they were all drunk or what. (laughs) People didn't show for some reason as senators. (laughs) Maybe C-SPAN changed that. I got no idea. Probably. That might be it. I just, 
I, I was thinking about that the other day in the impeachment setting uh, when everybody was talking about the Belknap impeachment and what it meant and what the vote was. And I noted that uh, I think like 10 senators skipped the vote on jurisdiction in yeah. in, in the Belknap thing. Like, what are you talking about? I mean, you'd be, I don't know what you would do. This would be a serious issue of 10 senators. Uh, and, and there were only 70 Four, I think, at the time. So for 10 of them to miss it, you know, it's over 10% of the Senate was just, I don't know. And they probably were drunk back in those days. <laughs> well, the travel was a lot harder. Right. They weren't on True. TV. They were responsible I also people. wonder if that's and led to more hmm. nonsense on the floor. That certainly appears to be the case. And, uh, and, you know, remember the, another... The, was a, Sullivan, who stands up every week and does his Alaskan of the week, that probably in <laughs> the nice. old days would have just been submitted to the congressional yes. record and and not not done on the floor. But now, you know, probably C-SPAN's true. there. Yeah. I mean, that definitely made a difference in the way things... Newt Gingrich was very explicit about what a difference C-SPAN made in the way he approached things, and it was relatively new for him. Uh, but again, also just like another part of our earlier discussion, file C-SPAN under those things that were like, what a great reform, letting people see transparency. Of course we're for that. And then it was like, well, you know, one of the unforeseen circumstances was, uh, or uh, effects was people like Newt Gingrich, you know, getting up there and railing in these speeches as though they were speaking to a full chamber. This was an early problem. The cameras don't pan. And, right. uh, uh, Gingrich knew that, and he railed in special orders speeches for which there's usually nobody else in the chamber. But it looked like he was speaking to the full Congress, and he was sending around clips of, you know, what a powerful person I am. And at one point, he is so infuriated Tip O'Neill, then Speaker, famously, uh, that he that O'Neill ordered the cameras to turn and show that there was nobody in the in the chamber. And it ended up becoming an issue for, for O'Neill and people wanted to censure him for it. I'm not certain whether they ever actually accomplished that, but it ended up making O'Neill look bad. But uh, I guess since then they've mastered the art of pretending they're doing something important when they're really just wasting time and it's affected. Things. And doing the important stuff off camera. Yes. Right. True. Hiding in a way. Uh, so even that the, the transparency reform didn't, didn't really work out in that respect. Interesting. No. Just another one to add to the list. So, how's it going there? <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you were explaining to me in the break, and I don't know if you want to jump right to it or, or get something else in first, but uh, you do have some thoughts about what's going on with the reconciliation bill and an important addition that I think was omitted. I don't know if I made it all the way through the Politico article or not, but a great point about something that we haven't read yet about uh, the Green New Deal and various bits of climate legislation and the problems it might have. With well, and coronavirus relief. Ah, yeah. OK. Which is important for now. Yeah. The House Rules Package passed in January exempts that spending from PAYGO rules. Right now, it. how that plays out in actuality as they're crafting this and as they're dealing with Repu Republicans, I'm not <laughs> sure. But the new rules say, you know, these things aren't in Pago. So yes. that's good because I groaned when they they did make a mention of Pago up at the top, but then they didn't mention, oh, but actually these particular things are exempted from Pago by the House rules this time. That seems like an oversight. Yeah. Okay. It, that that is a rather glaring oversight I thought in the Politico yeah, article. I didn't notice it at the time and and, I and you've got House Budget Chair Yarmouth telling Politico I've not been told to be concerned. I don't know whether to be concerned or not. <laughs> well, he yeah. should be because he knows because he was there when they passed this rule and he was <laughs> yeah. critical in in writing it that yeah, they exempted all of the spending from hmm. Pago. Now, are you going to get challenges about minimum wage or who knows what? Possibly, but 
I don't know that this is a big as deal as Politico is telling us it is. Hmm. Okay, well, that's helpful to know. And then I guess the next question one day we'll have to analyze what is Yarmouth clueless or too savvy for the press? I don't know. Uh, I was told it wasn't a problem. Why not? Gee whiz, I'm just a simple, you know, I'm an unfrozen caveman congressman. I don't know. Uh, I was just told not to worry about it. Uh, is it, in fact, because you helped write a rules package that uh, that undid the problem beforehand and what? And maybe you don't want that pinned on you. That could be it. I don't well, know. That could be I it. Just, I um, don't know. I'm just a simple guy I, from K- Kentucky. I, the Senate doesn't pass the same rules package, but on spending bills, the Senate has to defer to the House. Hmm. So, I don't think it's an issue. I guess it's not. Yeah, and the only only thing left to figure out is uh, how coy is Yarmouth playing it. And my guess is, come on, he's the chairman of the budget committee. (laughs) He knows what's going on. As you point out, he had a hand in writing it. He's just saying, I don't know, they told me it wasn't a problem. Boy, talk about short attention spans. Hmm. The House Rules Package was kind of a big deal because yeah, it did this. Right. And we've already forgotten. And, you know, I guess, uh, I don't know, uh, by way of deflecting blame, I'll say, well, we impeached the president the second time and there was That's an insurrection true. and uh, we almost didn't exist as a democracy, but then we did. <laughs> so I don't know. I guess it's easy a to forget. A lot got lost. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, we elected two Democrats in Georgia. Right, right, yeah. And those all happened in between the adoption of the rules package and, you know, the seventh day of January. There was a four-day span in which we changed those rules and said, all right, we did it. Fantastic. Now, everybody pay attention to Georgia. We got to pull this off. All right, we did it. Oh, revolution underway. (laughs) Shoot. (laughs) Uh, All right, well, we got to take care of that. Okay, good. We did it. Uh, definitely going to impeach a president the second time, and maybe he's president now, and maybe he isn't, and jurisdiction, and bad faith, and then, uh, okay, fine, and then trial, and then we're going to have witnesses. No, we're not going to have witnesses. And then snowstorm in Texas, I guess. Throw that in there as well. (laughs) And then, yeah, okay. uh, But, yeah, I mean, it seems like a million years ago, and it's a month. Yeah. I guess that's it. Thankfully, you remembered Good. Great job. That's why you're here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm choosing to set that aside on things that I'm worried about for now and focusing more on the problem that is the Senate. I'm with you on it now. I'm, now I feel a lot better. Yes. Okay. That's good. I'm glad I could do that for you. Yes, right. I know. I just make you feel worse. What a what a trade this is. <laughs> but okay. And were you pleased to find out that former Bush... George W. Bush speechwriter David Frum is with you on the filibuster. Uh, it's nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. I mean, I'll take it. Yeah, I, I, if you celebrate too much, someone will tweet me that David Frum is a, once a bad guy and might still be. And okay, I know. Yeah, that's true. He's yeah. but he's also with us on guns, and that's helpful. And that's been his transition. I, you know, guns and filibuster; those are two pretty good things. Uh, I don't pay him any money. He doesn't pay me any money. So. It is what it is. Yeah, it was nice to find out. He's a powerful voice. Well, and he what's convinces interesting people. to me is that now Mansion and Cinema, who's their uh, audience? Adam Jendelson pointed this out last night. Uh, who, who who are they playing to now? If uh, all of the moderates are saying, "Yeah, this filibuster problem is huge," and if we're going to save the country, eh. yeah, okay, that is a good point too, and certainly. Yeah, people in their states are going to start to realize these. Are, there are some things that we absolutely have to have here, and here they want it. And Cinema and Mansion are on board for the substance, and might even be on board. Uh, certainly, are on board for voting for the program, but have pledged themselves on this question of the filibuster. And so now it's not going to happen because what? You won't be flexible. Is essentially what you're saying. Yeah. So, okay. You're going to essentially vote with the white supremacists to block all of this critical Mm. relief to your constituents. 
for sure. the Jim Crow filibuster for yeah. a a long ago, long past ideal that never existed of unity and bipartisanship. Hmm. Really? Okay. I mean, yeah, that'll make it tough for them. Which is why I think I, I wrote a long piece yesterday on how they should force this on the two of them is with the HR1 and S1, the For the People Act. Ah, okay. That restores a lot of voting rights. That really takes on sort of the the anti-majoritarian system head on mm-hmm. um, with expanding access to voting, uh, universal registration, all of these things to reform the electoral system and to basically bring back voting rights to stop all of the Southern states in their mad rush, Southern states and Idaho oh. <laughs> to keep people okay. from the polls. Yes. So I, th- I think it's the right bill to, mm. to challenge cinema and mansion on. Certainly a good start. Yeah. And I hope it works. I mean, I did, it would be pretty darn galling. Yeah. To have those two be the reason we can't have nice things ever again. It would be. Uh, Arizona <clears throat> uh, also putting on something of a show in uh, uh, the drive of its Republican state legislature for more voting restrictions, as well as, you know, censuring everybody and, and any Republicans who might be sympathetic to anything that Democrats were in favor of, whether it was involved in the impeachment or anything else. Um, I think uh, I just read the other day that it was in Arizona that uh, a state senator who refused to join in the vote to hold Maricopa County's Board of Supervisors in contempt for refusing to hand over all their voting machines and ballots so that Republicans in the state Senate there could push forward the still you know, stupid existing uh, conspiracy theory that the election was stolen. And uh, <laughs> they're they're in the business of uh, censuring Republican state senators who are simply saying, look, enough with this. I already figured out who won the election already. And this fake stuff has got to go and it's killing us. They're still getting censured there. Uh, so the fact that they're also passing voting restrictions, like you mentioned, in one, sweeping the southern states and Idaho, uh, yes, I guess this is in the background of cinema's thinking. It's is level. she thinking she's going to make friends with these Republicans, that they're going to be nice to her mm, no, next time around? That, but uh, just I, I imagine she's preparing to have them uh, attacking her and running against her eventually. And I don't know what kind of balancing act she thinks she can pull off with these guys but i don't well and that she's doing it over right now minimum wage Hmm. when yeah (laughs) when her state just voted to raise the minimum wage you know (laughs) yeah 60 percent of voters Hmm. said yeah we need a hike in the minimum wage and they've got it now in arizona so maybe she thinks that's moot but right yeah it's Sort of going it. against the sentiment of her voters. Yes. And I have a hard time imagining anybody in um, West Virginia who's not thinking that, yeah, um, yeah a pay sure rate would be a good thing to have. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not certain. We'll, we'll see if it moves her. I think you might be right uh, in that I, I can't imagine what – I don't know what sort of deal she might think she could broker. But eventually, if she's worried about re-election, whenever that may come – uh, surely you're not going to want to have voting restrictions in place because we know what Republicans will do in way of targeting voting restrictions. Right. So you want to come back? Yeah, wear more wigs and and have a good time in the Senate, whatever it is that you're up to. Uh, yeah, you're going to need to have your base able to vote. So I really have no idea right. what she's about. At any given time, yeah, uh, and no one does. Is. I, I mean, you know, she before. was, she was Green Party Ralph Nader volunteer in two thousand, and 
I don't know, man. I don't, I don't know what her stick is, right. but I'm getting kind of frustrated with it. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll see whether she straightens anything out, but yeah, I think last time we discussed her, we came to the same conclusion. Now what, who, who is she? <laughs> How did we get her? And I think, I don't know. I think we might have tossed her up there to run for Senate. And I, my recollection is that we were like, oh, yeah, we'll never win the Senate in Arizona. Forget it. Who wants yeah. to run this time? You? All right, fine. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, my God, you won. We ought to figure yeah. out who you are. Okay. And we don't know who she is. And, and we don't know what Mark Kelly's going to do. If I, I don't think Mark Kelly's going to try to make as many. Hmm enemies within the democratic party yeah. as cinema seems intent on doing yeah, we don't like know we have a better sense we of will see is. okay ah uh, well here's also... something new we haven't oh. talked about. have we talked about judges taking senior status on the show mm. uh i don't think so this is kind of the sleeper issue that i didn't even think about okay. i mean i remember in the fall that Lindsey Graham was going around trying to sort of bully older judges who were eligible to take senior status into doing so that Trump would have more seats to fill. Yes, okay. Sounds since since exactly. Biden was inaugurated, in fact, since the election, there's just been a whole slew of them. Ah. Those who served long enough that they did the combination of their age and the the amount of service that they've had allows them to step back, to take senior okay. status, not to retire fully, but to lighten their load and to open up a seat. Mm. And tons of them have been doing so okay. for Biden. Uh, good, I think. Yes, yes. That's. It wasn't a thing Worries I was necessarily <laughs> thinking about when looking at how we're going to fix the judiciary. Um Hmm. Because I've been thinking about what reforms are needed. Do we expand the courts? And that needs to happen too. Yes. Yeah. But in essence, what these senior judges are doing is sort of allowing an expansion. Yeah. Because I they're still they're level. still there. They're still taking some cases, but they're opening up a seat, so it's a win-win. Yeah, I guess that's true, right? They and uh, we know that they're, they're decent the judges because they waited until. Trump was gone in mm. order to do this ah. so that their seats couldn't be filled by Trump. That's helpful, too. A nice tip of the cards there. And uh, so, right, yeah, when you're in senior status, you're still there and available to sit on cases when the caseload is heavy. But uh, they can replace you on active status with, a, you know, with somebody new without our having to change the composition of the courts. It doesn't happen on a Supreme Court. We don't have that. But no. uh, it happens in the uh, the rest of the federal bench. So that's good. And I guess everybody. And in fact, there are two of them right now on the D.C. circuit who have done this. OK. Which is kind of an important one. Uh, yes. Very important. All right. That's helpful. And uh, yeah, well, that that does create an early and really trouble free way of. Uh, at least changing the, the momentum and, and the directions of the courts. Uh, and as you point out, probably still some good reason to consider expansion, both of the Supreme Court and perhaps of the, the circuits as well. But uh, not the least free. because some of the circuits are just really overloaded right now. There are judges that are just piled under cases and there aren't enough judges. Ah. So expansion has to happen because it has to happen because there aren't enough judges, but also to dilute the Trump effect yes. on a lot of these di district and, and circuit courts. Okay. so that's But there perfect. is some good news on that front. That It's always nice to be able to report some good news. Yeah. So far, so good. We're doing all right with good news. And, uh, yeah, especially good news that doesn't require any uh, legislative action and also doesn't rely on executive orders which republicans have rediscovered they don't like uh, but uh, it doesn't you know re rely on mitch mcconnell yeah so i guess the only it's thing that relies on all is, evil in the nation yes uh, only thing that really we, we have to turn to him for is uh, dispensing with the judicial nominations once they're made uh, and uh, any word on the speed with which we might see those kick into gear from the Biden administration? I imagine they're ready. 
Oh, well, the, the, you know, before, once the election was done, they sent out a letter to Democratic senators saying, get your nominees into us. Okay. And these are the nominees we want. We want more diversity. We want more women. We want more women of color. We don't want corporate types. We want public defenders. Oh, we want nice. we want a much larger, more diverse group. And, of course, Michael Bennett pops up with some corporate lawyer for his first sure, recommendation. <laughs> Yeah. But th- there has been an early focus by the Biden administration and an effort to get Democratic senators in gear to get their nominees in. Um, how effectively okay. they've been doing that, I haven't seen. I just mm-hmm. know that the administration tried. Okay. Well, that's... Oh, and that's that Bennett right didn't step. follow the suggestion. <laughs> well, yeah. And a lot of them, you know, it's just a suggestion. And uh, maybe they don't even, I didn't think of him as a corporate lawyer. He's just a good friend of mine. Well, you right. know, a lot of people who move <laughs> in your circles get to move there because there are wealthy people. And they're wealthy because they're corporate lawyers, because public defenders don't make a lot of money. And that's kind of self-reinforcing. Um now that they're uh, getting their list together, of course, the Politico piece does mention blue slips. We've been over that extensively. Um, and uh, anybody who was still puzzled as to why you and I were uh, for Pat Leahy taking a back seat on some of this stuff probably figured it out during the impeachment trial. He didn't make any serious mistakes, but he didn't didn't look or sound too good. No, he didn't. Quite honestly. And he so, had, you know, been in the hospital overnight. Yeah, that didn't help. The week before. See, so. He was yeah, not feeling well on top of it all. Um, but yeah, uh, he's made the blue slip mistake twice. He's now no longer going to be in charge of that. And that's Although I haven't seen definitively that Durbin is going to mm. ignore yeah. blue slips. Have you? Uh, no. Uh, more likely to than... Leahy ever was, or say Feinstein. Yes. Imagine, you know, oh, oh, you don't want Leahy? Oh, All right, God. how about Feinstein? Yeah. Well, I was thinking yeah. of an improvement, actually. <laughs> I wonder if you have anybody. <laughs> One I... thing that Durbin has done is he's created some new subcommittees in judiciary. Hmm. Oh. Oh, okay. Um, One that's going to be looking at dark money kinds of things, and he hmm. put Sheldon Whitehouse in charge of that. One that's going to be look on looking at um, criminal justice reform, and he put Booker in charge of that. Oh, okay. So, so there's some good stuff happening on the Judiciary Committee, even yeah. though we don't yet know exactly what the status of blue slips is going to be. That is interesting. So, Senate Judiciary with some new subcommittees. Okay, mm-hmm. they likely may have uh, been found themselves in charge of some important subcommittees anyway. But I like yes. the refocus. Okay. The refocus is important. Um, it's it's good to see somebody realizes it's 2021 and hey. Yeah, we we don't have to have the same subcommittees, you, or you can have the same composition but change the focus of the subcommittee. That's just a matter of adopting different rules. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So that's a helpful addition. Uh, just a, a subcommittee on uh, nothing but. Uh, Criminal justice reform, is that right? Okay. That's what I, I, I didn't read the whole story. I just saw it in passing last night, but that was the impression oh, that I got from it. So. something like that. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, that is good news. And uh, something that escaped notice to this point, and I'm glad you brought it up. You made, as usual, some excellent additions and observations. That's why we have other people's voices on the show once in a while, you know? Catch but your voice things. is very fun. It's uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> but and it, I'm sorry I missed the Ides of March explanation uh, yesterday. I should, oh, okay. should have tuned in. Yeah, you Just know, you learn some show, weird yeah. things on the show every once in a while. And uh, thanks to Greg for that one. I'll, I'll send you a note about that one if you want to figure <laughs> that one out. Uh, but I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, okay, good. So we, last time we met, uh, we were. Uh, awaiting the start of the impeachment trial. And I I was thinking when we left last week, we probably said, oh, I think the whole thing will be over by the time we speak again. And I I, I think we predicted that correctly. Uh, I think we did because, you know, they all had to uh, go off and celebrate Valentine's Day. Yes. And uh, gosh, that's important. And uh, 
you know, everything, all the good Valentine's Day merchandise that's on sale now, they're at home to get it at their local retailer and boost the economy. This is very important. That must have been the reason they left. Okay. Well, thanks, Joan. We'll speak to you again <laughs> next week, at which point I believe they will be flying back to D.C. to get back to work. So we'll have some things to and, preview that. Yeah, get that coronavirus release fast. Possibly Good. even with a minimum wage hike. We will see. Yeah, that would be fantastic. We'll see we'll monitor developments between now and then. Thanks for coming by and clearing these things up for us. Uh, we'll We're we'll most welcome, again. and maybe we'll know more about Pago. Okay, yeah, an excellent point. Again, I can't thank you enough for reminding me of that one. All right, we'll check in with you next week. And time All right. Now, Okay, thanks, Joan. Time now for us to hand things over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy coming up next, and I better get to that and tell you what he's got on tap for you. Here we go. Let's throw in a couple things here. All those Republicans who shirked their impeachment responsibility and passed the buck to law enforcement will not remember they did so when law enforcement attempts to charge From Trump. From Good observation, I think. You have been listening to Kegro in the morning with David Waldman. House Republicans slam Joe Biden for using CDC guidelines to reopen the nation's schools. Gee whiz, how they do that? And DHS can finally investigate far-right extremism after Trump blocked it for years. Plus, the solar wind hack, the largest and most sophisticated attack the world has ever seen. More updates on that, plus more next.